I had just spoken at a church about a month before, and one of the guys I met ran the communications tower, I think, in, in, the, in the first tower. We spent an hour after the service talking about how he could share the gospel with his Jewish friend. And I remember about four or five days after the event happened, I was watching TV and I was able to, to see pieces of his funeral. I was sitting at my desk at 241 East 51st Street, the Chosen People headquarters in Manhattan between 2nd and 3rd. It was such a pleasant, normal day. It was a beautiful fall day. And I was just sitting there going over my work day when all of a sudden I heard a loud, shrill scream that was almost blood curdling. I, did, I had no idea what was going on. So I, I actually ran down the stairs to Marcy's reception desk and I said, What's going on? I expected there to be some kind of, some kind of attack on, on us because sometimes we're pretty vulnerable. She, she said, I just, I just heard it. A plane flew into the World Trade Center. So we went into our reception room, turned on the television, and so slowly more and more people came in and we were looking at uh, the North Tower, I believe, and smoke was billowing. Uh, from the place. Uh, I mean, we had no idea what was going on. It was so disorienting. Quickly, we realized, wait a minute, how are the people going to get out? Wait a minute, what about the people above where the plane came in? Never mind the people uh, below. And all of a sudden, it starts dawning on you, you know, that this is horrible. And then, as we're standing there, praying and and watching with one another and comforting one another. Do you know anybody there? Do you know anybody there? And then boom, the second plane crashes in uh, to the South Tower. A couple of our staff, one is a nurse and the other is an anesthesiologist, a doctor, but serving with us as missionaries. And I said, all right, they're, they're gonna probably need a lot of help with people. Just get going. Now, again, no cell phones. Little did we know that there were no subways, uh, no buses, I mean, nothing. Everything stopped. And so they walked. Well, I waited hours for them to get back. And of course, we're still watching the news reports. And now we're beginning to see people who, who fled as the towers were falling and they were all covered with dust and all covered with, with soot. I couldn't imagine where our two staff members were, whether or not, God forbid, something actually happened to them because time went on and went, went on and on. And they came back from NYU where they had gone to see if they would be useful. And I said, how did it go? They said, nobody needs us. I said, why is that? They said, it's not enough survivors. Every fireman who rushed into that building is, is dead. There was mass mor mourning in, in New York City. And I remember one situation where I was sitting next to a construction worker. and. We talked a little bit uh, where you don't really talk to people on the subway if you know New York. And I said, so how are you doing? He said, I'm okay. I said, did you lose anybody that you knew? He said, few. I said, yeah, me too. I said, how are you handling it? He says, I'm trying, you know, I'm trying to go to work and go through the motions, but you know, I'm just empty. My soul is empty. And I said, I understand it. I could easily feel the same way, except there's something a little bit different about my life maybe that I could share with you. He says, if it's, if it's any kind of an answer to help me feel better, I'll, I'll listen. And so I shared the gospel with him. And it was just the most meaningful, heart-to-heart -heart discussion between strangers. Now, a few days after that, we were celebrating the Jewish holiday of Rosh Hashanah, the new year. And we usually, and that's true of a lot of synagogues, you rent a larger space for the Jewish High Holy Days in the fall, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, because usually your synagogue can't handle everybody because that's when everybody goes to synagogue. That service was unforgettable. We probably had 150 or 200 people there and the place only sat about 115. I mean, it was packed. I preached from Psalm 23 that day. And the reason I preached from Psalm 23 is all over New York City, signs and posts and glued onto hospitals and Union Square and other places where people were gathering who were mourning and waiting for word about their loved ones was Psalm 23. And uh, people were so hungry 
for the presence of God. Now, I, I don't say that easily, and I'm not overstating it. I met a couple there that night. They look like the people I grew up with, which is probably true because they're from Queens and I was from Queens. And they were both high school, they were both school teachers, smiling throughout the whole service. And of course, everybody in general was pretty broken up. It wasn't an obnoxious smile, it was a sweet smile. And you could tell that they had some kind of joy in the midst of this tragedy. And afterwards I went up to them and I said, is this your first service with us? And they said, yeah. Are you from New York? Yeah, we're from Queens, we're, we're teachers. I said, you look like you believe in Yeshua and Jesus. They said, oh yeah, we do. I said, how long has that been? Two days. And I said, you gotta be kidding, there's gotta be a story there. They said, it's a simple story. Our Christian friends were trying to tell us about Jesus. We listened a little bit. We watched some Christian television, but we really didn't believe. And then 9-11 came and our daughter was in one of the towers. And we prayed and said, Jesus, if you save our daughter, we'll believe in you. Sure enough, the daughter was saved and this wonderful couple both accepted Jesus as their Messiah. I've been to Israel many times. I've walked the spots, the nightclub near the beach where people were blown up and understanding terrorism personally, deadly terrorism, I think changed the balance in America. And I think it helped a lot of Americans embrace Israel as a brother. Unfortunately, it also caused a lot of hatred towards Muslims. I hope and pray that that can be overcome as well. But it also helped a lot of people get a real heart for telling Muslims about Jesus. So how can we pray for the Middle East? In Psalm 122, verse 6, the psalmist tells us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Then he adds a promise, they will prosper who love thee. My prayer for you is that you will love Israel and love the Jewish people. Turn your love for the Father and for the Son and for the Jewish people into earnest and sincere prayer for the Jewish people and for the nation of Israel. So pray for the relationships between Israel and some of the Gulf states, particularly in Morocco, who are becoming uh, more aligned with Israel. We need to pray for God to work in the hearts of Iranian leaders, that they might turn to the Lord. When we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, we're praying that the Prince of Peace might reign on his rightful throne in your heart and in my heart and in the heart of Muslims and Jews, Israelis, and wherever Jesus goes, he brings peace.